I'll attempt to give you a little background. You, you need some background. This is 30 minutes <clears throat> from 33 months. We've tried to pull together a, a few highlights, I guess you'd call it, of the, that time that I spent in the Navy. I, I put a little handout out on your table. <clears throat> that is a, a brief summary of the ship that I was assigned to by another fellow. I don't know the gentleman who has written this, but then again, 500 men, I wouldn't have known more than 25 of them, probably, or 30. Uh, but somebody who was assigned to the ship had uh, written this summary for him. First of all, it was an unusual ship in that it was spent, uh, well, you can read here, 40, 33 years and a half for uh, it never lost a man. And it was in all, all the fragrances, if you want to call it that, except two. It didn't make Midway, which was just the other day, uh, the Battle of Midway and one other. So this is an effort to put this together and, and we have tried to pick out a few highlights. <coughs> Uh, I first, and I'll leave that a minute, when I left the ship, if you can hear me now, our captain told us we'd leave an address and three bucks. He would see that we got a ship's annual or a ship's log or whatever you want to call it. And he wanted to send it. He had a lieutenant who had experience in that, uh, making books like this and stuff. And the other thing, I kept a log for about 22 months daily. Uh, I kept it, I put it in my mattress. Uh, actually, I don't think you're supposed to have them, though I was told. But somehow I kept it every day. Uh, Whenever a picture in the annual and my date in this log coincided, you'll see that on the screen. And I have to give credit to my wife for pulling this off of that and coordinating it with a date in the book. Uh, don't ask me how she got it on this, but she got it on here. I'm not smart enough to know that. But she. We got it on that DVD, uh, and that's probably what you see. I had to make a few notes here. Uh, some of these pictures were not the best because uh, the pictures then and the little cameras they had uh, were somewhat marginal, if you could say that. Uh, I I don't know that. So I have to give credit to my wife for making it. If it wasn't for her, it wouldn't even exist. And it's something our kids wanted us to do. And we'll share it with you. It's, it's a different time, a different day. I don't know how many of you were born at this time. But uh, back a few years, and it was a totally different environment uh, than it is for this wartime, whatever you want to call it nowadays. So if you have questions afterwards, I'll try to answer them, whatever. And uh, or if you have questions about the printout, uh, uh, be glad to try to answer whatever you have. Sir Pearl Arbor, December 7, 1941. Remember Pearl Arbor, December 7, 1941. And do you remember where you were? Well, I do very well.
For me, I was 17 years old. I was just out of high school in May. I was working for the Frisco Railroad as a clerk and yard checker. I arrived at work at 7.30 that Sunday morning. I moved the mail to the post office. I heard the announcement on the radio by our President Roosevelt. And I thought, well, what does the future really hold for me? I worked for the Frisco Railroad until the spring of 43. And I joined then the U.S. Navy. I was then assigned to boot camp in Farragut, Idaho. And in the fall of 1943, I graduated from a radio radar school in San Diego. I was then assigned to the USS San Diego, which is a light, fast cruiser, having about 500 men aboard. Our Captain Mullins was a veteran officer of the cruiser Vincennes, which was sunk in the Battle of Sabo Island, where he lost most of one hand. There were several new recruits on our ship as radiomen. There were about a dozen sailors in the radio radar work on our ship. After leaving San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge, we sailed for six days. The sea was very rough, and there was much seasickness. We arrived in Honolulu for our two-day liberty. and two days of liberty, we enjoyed lots of fresh pineapple milkshakes. And the Royal Hawaiian Hotel there was assigned to sailors, and you will note, a lot of laundry and shorts and t-shirts hanging out the windows. We were two full-fledged sailors now on the island and a long way from home. Our ship, the San Diego, was marched in May 1942. We traveled nearly 300,000 miles from Singapore the South Philippines to the Aleutian Islands in over three years. We missed very few battles. Late in 1943, we crossed the equator. For about 200 of us, it was the first time, and our ship practiced the old Navy tradition of making us polywog, those who had never crossed the equator before, into shellbacks. And becoming members of King Neptune's ancient order of the deep. Our ship's crew established a king and queen Neptune, two royal guards, and also the royal baby, all dressed appropriately. And you will note the cigar in the royal baby's mouth. Then all the polywogs, that's us, were drafted into work details, doing laundry, chipping paint, peeling potatoes, or whatever. Then we were prodded through a paddling line and uh, sitting on a hot seat, bowing before the king and queen. We had to kiss the royal queen's belly, and if not humbled enough, we then had to kiss the royal baby's butt. We were drenched with kissing grease and garbage and so forth to ensure we were properly humble then before the king and queen. If there were no battle alerts, this went on for 24 hours, and those who were properly humbled received a certificate, which I still have. The ones who could not take this punishment got a double dose of the same. I doubt this is still practiced today since there are females now in the Navy. We were operating off the coast of the Philippines looking for enemy shipping when we were attacked by Japanese dive bombers and fighters. Our gunnery crews were among the best in the Pacific. And we were attacked most of the day by these Jap planes, and you will note one of them hit the water in the foreground. We were always on the lookout for Japanese subs. This picture is a two-man sub sunk off the coast. 
early December 17th, 1944. We had church that morning. That Christmas carol that we sang. Soon the sea had started getting very rough. Our fleet was moving now southeast on the Philippine coast. We were nearly in the middle of a huge Pacific typhoon. We switched to a southeast course with the wind approaching 100 to 150 miles per hour, or sometimes higher. We were taking 48 degree rolls and waves 50 to 60 foot high. Another ship could not be seen. We were taking water down our stack and all the surface entry points were sealed. We went right through the eye of this hurricane. It was totally still in the center of that eye. The next day, after the storm let up, our fleet admiral took inventory of his ships <clears throat> and sent our ship and two other destroyers back to search the area where we had passed the two days before. As a result of our ship, we found three destroyers missing. Life rafts and debris were everywhere. We picked up five men from one raft and their ship had gone down and another had been also sunk. Two small carriers also had the planes on their deck to break loose and it caused fire. The carriers were dead in the water. One of the large carrier planes broke loose. Most of the top deck was unusable and most of the planes were wrecked. We never heard the official count of lives, but our crew had estimated there could, could have been and must have been 600 men at least lost. Our fleet Admiral Halsey also was about to be court-martialed after the war for his decision to take us through that hurricane. We always had non-denominational church services on all the Sundays and holidays if they were not at battle stations. Most of the time, a sailor would lead a few songs and a prayer for the service. On February 18, 45, we fired on a Jap radio station on Chichi Jima. Then we arrived February 19th, Iwo Jima, and the 4th and 5th Division Marines were landing in waves as above. We were some distance behind the landing craft. On February 19th, the Marines established their beachhead, <laughs> and for the next 36 days, there were approximately 100,000 Marines and Naval personnel fighting on and around this six-mile-long island. February 20th, we received word today on the radio that the casualties on Iwo Jima were very high. And it's one time I was sure glad that I had made the naval enlistment instead of the Marines. The photo is giving whole blood and plasma to the wounded. During April and May, our task group under Admiral Halsey was advised that we would be in the vicinity of Okinawa invasion for six to eight weeks. The picture is a landing of men equipment and supplies along the coast of Okinawa. And during this time, numerous ships and carriers of our task group were hit by either kamikaze planes or torpedoes. We operated again with the destroyer Haggard for many months during the Pacific Campaign. So on April 29th, 1945, our commander ordered the destroyer Haggard to proceed 10 miles away from our fleet as a picket. They were to report on any approaching enemy plane. After arrival on this position, the Haggard was attacked and hit by a kamikaze plane. Our ship to San Diego and another destroyer, the Hazelwood, were dispatched to support the Haggard and give aid as needed to put out the fire. Then the fire was finally put out, so we prepared this 
to take aboard wounded. When we pulled alongside, we took on board several members of the Haggard, and this took several hours. And while the destroyer was approaching us, she was also attacked and hit by two Japanese kamikaze planes. This badly damaged the Hazelwood, and most of the officers and about 150 men were killed. But the ship did not sink. So again the San Diego began taking on board the wounded from the Hazelwood. There were very many of these men who were seriously hurt. We turned our mess hall into a hospital operating room for 36 hours. The wounded sailors, and there were many, was also transferred from the Hazelwood to the San Diego. And then the next day, we had our burial at sea. I'm not sure how many were buried, as I did not record any numbers. Finally, those two badly damaged destroyers were then towed toward Guam by other assigned destroyers with the hopes of being repaired. Then we proceeded south to meet the hospital ship Solus two days later off the point of Okinawa. We were still off Okinawa in southern Japan on May 11, and we were launching airstrikes against southern Japan when our task group came under attack again by two Japanese kamikaze planes. One of the large carriers, called the Bunker Hill, took a direct hit with much fire and destruction. This picture of the Bunker Hill was taken by one of the Bunker Hill sailors. The sailor did not survive but the camera was found later and the picture saved. Then this is a picture of the Bunker Hill taken a few seconds later from another ship nearby. As the day ended, our task group had to return to Ulithi Atoll for fuel and supplies. The Bunker Hill followed us, still under her own power, and then anchored next to us and try to make repairs. The crew indicated to us that they had buried 466 men at sea during the previous two days. Then off the coast in July of 45, we were still operating around the coast of Japan, maybe a hundred miles out. Our carriers were launching airstrikes against Japanese cities. And our crew at this time, as were the crews of other ships, were issued guns. And we were told that we would have training to be a part of the landing on the Jap mainland. As the Marines pushed inland, we were to clean out the ports so that our ships could dock. Then we heard of a big bomb being dropped on Hiroshima and it had been kept so secret that we knew nothing of an atomic bomb and thought it just might be three or four big bombs tied together. But in a day or two the second one was dropped on Nagasaki. The captain announced what he thought it was and he was guessing that the war might just end. But the next day we launched another airstrike on Tokyo but then the Admiral recalled all the planes as it looked like the Japs were going to give up. Our crew went nuts. We were ecstatic. It was an experience I'll never forget. We received Admiral Badger aboard our ship and that made our ship the San Diego the flagship and the first entering Tokyo Bay to take possession of Yokosuka Naval Base and Tokyo Harbor Bay itself. 
You will note the Admiral's flag is flying from our ship. Then entering Nohio Bay, we could see Mount Fuji as the sun was rising that morning. And it was a beautiful view. And that coast was very quiet with flags, white flags, everywhere. And we were taken then on Jap guides and Japanese interpreters as we passed through Tokyo Bay. We were approaching Yokosuka Naval Base where we were to anchor and you could see all the huge cranes with Bethlehem steel signs on them all of them imported from the USA. Headlines in the Tulsa world back home on August 28, 1945. And then headlines that we found in the Tokyo News. But we didn't know what it said. By now, Jap guides, interpreters, and lower ranking officers were aboard our ship. They were to ensure safe passage to a naval dock in Yokosuka Bay. They are taken on board and frisked for weapons. More Jap officers and the press come to board to prepare for the final papers to be signed. Everyone now is sitting around very patiently waiting to get everybody together to sign the papers. After docking at Yokosuka Naval Base, a Japanese working party put the gang plank from the dock up to the USS San Diego on August 30, 1945. Here Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Halsey are leaving our ship to greet the Japanese officers who were to sign the naval base over to the USA. You will note there that there is a 1938 Dodge car and also a shiny new 1940 Packard that had brought these Jap officers to the ceremony. This brought on a very loud boo from the crew of the San Diego as they knew there would not be any cars at home when they were discharged. The crew all left their posts to see the signing of these documents and to see the Jap officers with all their white gloves on. Our last day in port, uh, Captain Mullins advised all of the crew members we could go ashore, but we were to stay within a short distance of the naval yard. That soon ended in a tragedy, as two of our members were gathering artifacts and souvenirs one of them exploded and both were killed and we were all called back to the ship. Burial will be a sea. BJ Day, September 2, 1945. There was much happiness in the land and particularly on our ship. We pulled anchor on September 2nd to head home. Some had not been home for two or more years and we met the battleship Missouri entering Tokyo Bay to sign the final papers as we were leaving that bay. That day after we were 200 miles east of Tokyo we heard the peace being signed by radio. At 11 a.m. Tokyo time and at President Truman declared BJ Day at 11.10 a.m. To note the picture General MacArthur Standing, Admiral Halsey and King also standing, and Admiral Nimitz signing. Okay. On September the 3rd, our first day out, 200 miles out, just at sunrise, we had our burial at sea for two of our members who didn't make it. At sunrise that morning, September the 3rd, the ship's chaplain said a few words and then a prayer. The two fallen mates, with shells tied between their legs, wrapped in a sheet, slid from under our flag into the depths of the ocean with hardly a ripple in the water.
This was a sad morning for all of us. These two men had given their best for most of the war, and they lost their lives in the last day after peace was signed. We kept sailing east for two weeks with a convoy. September the 14th, we arrived in San Francisco and saw the Golden Gate Bridge. It had been two years at sea. Big welcome home sign was also on the shoreline that welcomed all ships home. The last picture was I made in the uniform of a radar in second class was March of 46, and I received normal discharge in Seattle, Washington. Now the papers that, that uh, were signed on the San Diego, that was not the, the one, one the final paper signed on the Missouri the battleship. Final State. paper, Missouri was coming in when we left. <clears throat> the way that I was told, <clears throat> about the time or maybe a day before we docked, the Air Force had put down a couple of planes on the Tokyo airstrip. I don't know how they did it, because it was bombed out totally. Uh, and they set up radio and a place to sign over the airport. The job of this admiral was to receive that naval base and Tokyo Bay. So there were two efforts there, and then as we left that day, <coughs> the Missouri was coming in. And that was the big, the big signing. As, as such, yeah. yeah. And the reason we left is we'd been promised to come home for three or four or five months, but every time they canceled it and moved it up, and <clears throat> so we we got to we got to leave as quick as anybody, and uh, that created lots of good feelings. <laughs> sure. Was the, was the San Diego in service during Pearl Harbor? No. Yeah. It wasn't uh, launched until 40, the spring of 42, I believe it was. <clears throat> it was launched in Boston, and there were five other ships similar to that were launched all about the same time. They were all designed for speed and, <coughs> well, I tell you, if you saw a movie uh, sister ship of the San Diego was a movie that the five Sullivan brothers was on that was sunk. All the whole family went down with it. Well, it was a sister ship of this one. They operated together, and so there was five of those ships made. <laughs> they couldn't have taken a torpedo. There was too much ammunition in them. Powder to, to feed those 16 guns. It took a tremendous amount of powder and lead. And that's the reason that ship, that sister ship, and went down so quick that it just blew up the sky. Anyway, uh, that's kind of our story and whatever it amounts to. And our kids were pushing for it. And, uh, and I can see. As one of the girls said, it's only 20-some years till it'll be 100 years ago. I forgot how many she said, but, but she'd already figured it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>